Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first learning episode in a series of 12. Hi, I'm Beth Malkus Staffa, and today I will be presenting with Deborah Seltzer and Sandra Ortega. These episodes are filled with resources and exercises to help you create your CDC strategy worksheets and improve your prevention programs. And evaluate if you are reaching your priority populations and making an impact on the risk and protective factors you have chosen. You're right, Sandra, and we will be using a continuous quality improvement model to help us do this, as you see on the screen. We have three overarching objectives for this learning series, which are listed on the slide. The episodes are a ready-made and self-paced resource for the use of both funded RPE and non-funded RPE preventionists, grant writers, and supervisors implementing prevention programming around sexual violence, teen dating violence, bullying, and gender-based violence. You can watch the episodes by yourself, or you may choose to watch them together as a team made up of your agency and community stakeholders. Where appropriate, we have identified ways to do this virtually as a team. All episodes take at most 10 to 20 minutes to watch. We have included a handout with key terms, activities and exercises to build your skills and resources. The slide deck and transcript will also be included. The following are the learning objectives for this episode. If you haven't downloaded or printed out your handout for this episode, now would be a good time to press pause. We will be using the handout for some of the exercises during this episode. In our series, we'll be talking about continuous quality improvement or CQI. For those of you who come from a hospital setting, the term may be familiar. The hospital system has a quality assurance committee to audit and check different processes. The quality assurance committee studies each hospital's process and identifies ways to improve or maybe stop a deficiency from happening the next time. In the public health, we implement a similar system. This slide shows the model we use. We plan our strategies based on a list of criteria. We do or implement our program we study or evaluate, and we use these findings to make changes before implementing a strategy again. CQI, or Continuous Quality Improvement, shows why evaluation is an important part of what we do. Through using a CQI model, we can identify if our strategies are effective for stopping sexual violence before it happens. And identifying what strategies really increase a protective factor or decrease a risk factor. From a resource standpoint, including time, money, and other resources, the strategies can be tweaked, changed, or stopped if they don't work. When a prevention program uses CQI, the results are important to share with other preventionists. It can save money, time, and energy. We work smarter in Ohio. My favorite part of CQI model are the planning and the studying stages. Maybe I'm weird, but this extends to my personal life. I like to take time to look back and see how far I've traveled. I do this when I hike by checking the type of trail I was on and the time it took to walk. I do the same thing in my job. What do you mean? One example, I like to think about how primary prevention was defined in the 1990s and what we considered primary prevention now. It's important to remember our history and how we got here. Yes. I'll be frank, I see sexual violence prevention now entering preschool and we still have a lot to learn like what strategies work or how they work or why they work or... Whoa, Beth, you're moving too fast into our series. I can see where Beth is going. Our field didn't really take hold until the last 20 years, and much has happened. Let's take some time to reflect. Pause the module and answer the reflection questions in your handout.
As far as sexual awareness or sexual assault awareness month activities, I've personed many tables and handed out tip sheets about how to keep people safe and local hotline numbers. And we called this primary prevention by counting how many cards we handed out. I also participated in the NSVRC, It's Time. I helped person to table at uh, ODH and handed out SARC code cards. And I remember trying to get my coworkers to hold the clock and write a It's Time message. Those who were willing to take their photo knew me and what they were, were telling a friend about the hotline or talking to a daughter about healthy relationships. ODH used their internet uh, email system to share the pictures. I also observed a lot of people avoiding my table. Looking back, my activities were more awareness. First presentations I did in the mid 80s boasted a lot on myths and facts. I know now that it's important to focus more on the positive changes we want rather than repeating well-known inaccurate information. From an evaluation perspective, I remember when we first started out, many of our evaluations focused on if the person liked the presentation. We didn't ask if the person learned anything or if the same person after the presentation felt more confident to be an active bystander. I'm sure many of you wrote down interesting memories of past SAMS activities. Did you know that the SAM or Sexual Assault Awareness Month became an official national event in 2001? I think this is an important reason to study the past. Before SAM became official, there have always been people wanting to end sexual violence. The first known group of women in the United States to break the silence and speak out against sexual assault were black women. These courageous women testified before Congress in response to a white mob gang raping multiple black women during the Memphis riots of 1866. It should be noted at this time, white men were legally allowed to rape enslaved black women. Black, indigenous and brown women have always been leading and in informing prevention, even though their voices have been systemic, systematically silenced or erased. Like the Memphis riot example. Yes. It's important to remember these women of 1866 and incorporate their stories into our programs. These women laid the groundwork for our policy work. Some may not know, the Ohio Department of Health receives its prevention dollars from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. The original, original source of these funds come from the Violence Against Women Act. One of the benefits of working with CDC has been using a public health model to inform our work. It is a roadmap showing us how to do our work. I think so, Sandra. Using the public health approach to violence prevention really helped grow what works and what doesn't. The model identified the best available evidence to inform and design our programs. It helps with planning, the planning stage of the continuous quality improvement model. Using the public health model continues to grow our prevention work. It isn't static. If the public health model is new to you, refer to your episode one getting started handout to learn more. As Sandra said in the last slide, our work over the last 15 years hasn't been static. CDC and other prevention researchers have provided us with tools to help us better plan and implement our work. This slide illustrates a piece of our prevention history. We pulled from different models, such as the ecological model for health promotion, now known as the social ecological model, and we learned from other prevention movements, such as tobacco and drug and alcohol prevention. What jazzed me up as a prevention educator was the connecting the dots and how it identified shared risk and protective factors and other forms of violence. And the Stop SV technical package and how it pulled everything together into one package. I could only wish if I had something like the Stop SV technical package when we were starting out in the late 1990s. But the work doesn't stop, it's still evolving. 
And through a community of practice, we continue to learn and provide evidence showing what programs, policies, and practices work out in the field. This is why it's important to document your work. We are sharing nationally what is working or not working in Ohio. We do this through the CDC prevention strategy forms, which you'll learn more about in a later episode. If you're unfamiliar with these documents in the slide, please refer to your handout. In Ohio, we use CDC's work and we plan, implement, and evaluate our prevention work using a social justice, equity, and inclusion lens. Black women have always and continue to influence our prevention movement. What we do know is sexual and gender violence can't be eradicated without working on racism and poverty. Yes, it is another evaluation point we include in our continuous quality improvement model. I've included some resources in your handout about these women. Part of the CQI model is being open to studying or evaluating what is working with your prevention program and what isn't. CQI emphasizes that modifying and redesigning based on what we are learning is a good thing. It is something that can be shared with other programs in Ohio who may be struggling with the same issues. Before the next episode, we are asking that you be sure you have a copy or electronic copy of the items on this list. If you're an RPE funded program and need help finding these forms for your program, contact Beth or Deborah. We can send them to you. If you aren't funded by OEH, you might not have these in place yet. These episodes will identify the documents to help improve your program. Another piece of CQI is understanding the logic behind why you are implementing your strategies. This is a good time to pause the program and reflect on the questions in the handout. These are some of the ideas we'll be working on during this learning series. Don't worry if you had trouble answering the reflection questions. For me, those questions only led me down the rabbit hole of more questions. The takeaways from this episode are to be able to discuss the history of sexual and gender-based violence prevention. In the beginning, when we were doing sex sexual and gender-based violence prevention, we were focused more on risk reduction and awareness. Now we are working on the STOP SV technical package and we are still growing to find out what works. I need to mention you're part of this growth by sharing what you're learning. It's the CQI in action. We also remember how our movement has silenced some voices, specifically the voices of women of color. These women have been courageous and have always and continue to influence our movement. And we must work on racial justice and equity as we work on sexual and gender violence. This episode also described the continuous quality improvement model. It is a cycle that is never ending and it helps us to do our work better by being smart in how we plan, implement, and evaluate our programs. Today's episode, we mentioned several resources that I think are helpful for getting started on your CQI plan. If you're new in the field or have several years under your belt, I find these resources are my go-to for keeping current in the prevention field. I also use Ohio's S in IPV preventionist competencies to help me stay focused. If you're not familiar with the preventionist competencies, please email Ann Brandon, Caitlin Burke, or myself, and I will send you a copy. We will send you a copy. And you can find more resources on your handout. Thank you for joining us today for the first episode, getting started on our continuous quality improvement series. Remember, we are here to support you. So just reach out to any of us if you want individual TA or just want to bounce an idea off of us. A special thank you to Jasmine Barfield for her techie and vlogger expertise. 
The result of working with her has advanced our work forward by using a different learning platform. We are very grateful. Finally, a program about CQI wouldn't be complete if I didn't ask you to fill out the evaluation following this episode. Your input will help us with future episodes and identify if we need additional resources. Stay tuned for our next episode. We will be discussing strategies, approaches, and the PPPs.